Welcome everybody to the evening Bhagavad Gita class. So I see we have a, a group here. Are you a group from where are you coming from? Huh? Delhi. Delhi. Oh, you're coming from Delhi. Oh, you just how long are you gonna be here? Uh -huh. Okay, how long are you gonna stay in Vrindavan? How long to stay? Huh? Tonight? Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, welcome everybody to the Bhagavad Gita class. Um, so we are reading Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is. And I will recite the prayers. Om Gyananti Marandasha Ganagana Salakaya Taksumalitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Saitanya Manobi Stam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swami Rupa Karamayam Dadati Swa Padanti Kam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Parakamalam Shri Guru Vaisnavam Cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Fritam Stam Sajivam Savadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahita Sahitam Krishna Saitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padantahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagapate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishabhano Sutta Devi Panamami Hari Priye Vancha Kapis Tarubia Cha Kripa Sindhubi Eva Cha Patita Nam Pavanebio Vaishnavio Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Saitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vasari Gauda Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're reading um, Chapter 14 uh, The Three Modes of Material Nature Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So uh, the, the verse I'm doing um, is uh, 6, and I'll um, read the, the, the Sanskrit, and then the devotees can read. Tatcha sadvam nimila vat pakasakam anamayam Sukhas again a banati Yana sang in a chanaga. Okay, so we'll do word for word. Tatra there Sadvam the mode of goodness Nimalavat being purest in the material world. Prakasakam illuminating Anamayam without any sinful reaction Sukha with happiness Sangena by association Banati conditions Jnana with knowledge Sangena by association. Cha also. Anaga 
O sinless one. O sinless one, the mode of goodness being purer than the others is illuminating, and it frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode become conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. So please repeat after me. O sinless one, the mode of goodness being purer than the others is illuminating, and it frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode become conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. Purport by His very divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. You did? We did up till four yesterday. So I think you have both finances. Well, what I'll do is, she told me six. So what I'll do is, what I plan to do is to go through from one up until my verse. So that'll cover number five. Okay? I just said. Yeah. It's okay. I'm going to cover it. No problem. The living entities conditioned by material nature are of various types. One is happy, another is very active, and another is helpless. All these types of psychological manifestations are causes of the entity's conditioned status in nature. How they are differently conditioned is explained in this section of Bhagavad Gita. The mode of goodness is first considered. The effect of developing the mode of goodness in the material world is that one becomes wiser than those otherwise conditioned. A man in the mode of goodness is not so much affected by material miseries, and he has a sense of advancement in material knowledge. The representative type is the brahmana, who is supposed to be situated in the mode of goodness. This sense of happiness is due to understanding that, in the mode of goodness, one is more or less free from sinful reactions. Actually, in the Vedic literature, it is said that the mode of goodness means greater knowledge and a greater sense of happiness. The difficulty here is that when a living entity is situated in the mode of goodness, he becomes conditioned to feel that he is advanced in knowledge and is better than others. In this way, he becomes conditioned. The best examples are the scientist and the philosopher. Each is very proud of his knowledge. And because they generally improve their living conditions, they feel a sort of material happiness. This sense of advanced happiness in conditioned life makes them bound by the mode of goodness of material nature. As such, they are attracted toward working in the mode of goodness, and as long as they have an attraction for working in that way, they have to take some type of body in the modes of nature. Thus, there is no likelihood of liberation or of being transferred to the spiritual world. Repeatedly, one may become a philosopher, a scientist, or a poet, and repeatedly become entangled in the same disadvantages of birth and death. But due to the illusion of the material energy, one thinks that sort of life is pleasant. So the verse again is, O sinless one, the mode of goodness being purer than the others is illuminating, and it frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode become conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. So in this chapter, Krishna is telling Arjun that he's going to give him um, more of an understanding, you know. He's going to um, talk to him about the, the, this supreme, the, the supreme wisdom, the best of all knowledge, knowing which all the sages have, have attained the supreme perfection. 
So um, in this purport, I'm back, I'm on number one. I'm gonna just briefly go through one, two, six, to go back to my verse. Just because th there are new devotees here, and just to give a little bit of background of, of what this chapter is going to contain. So in, verse, in text number one, um, I just took out maybe one sentence that you know, I can expand on just a little bit because we just have until 6.30 and I want to get back to text number six. But um, in this first text in the purport, purport, it says in the 13th chapter, what's the title of the 13th chapter? The title of the 13th chapter is, okay. So the nature and joy in consciousness is a chapter in which Krishna is explaining about the Secha and the Secha Gan and uh, the, Secha, the Gayam. So that's uh, the Jiva soul and he has to know his body and what the field of activities is. Okay, and who is the uh, controller, the supreme person, you know, who knows all bodies. We only know our body, but he knows everybody's body. And it's said in, um, in the introduction to the Gita, which is the one I always like to remember is, Krishna follows the psychic movements of every single living entity. So he knows everything about everybody. We only know our body and what's happening in our body. We cannot say what's happening in somebody else's body because we don't know. But Krishna knows everybody because we're all part and parcel of Krishna. So he knows you inside out. He probably knows you better than you know yourself. He knows everything you're going to do, everything you're thinking, everything you're thinking about doing, all the things you don't think you want him to know that you're doing. He knows everything. Okay. So it said in the 13th chapter, it was clearly explained that by humbly developing knowledge, one may possibly be free from the pure entanglement. So this one sentence here is saying that... Uh, you have to be humble if you want to access this knowledge. You have to be submissive. Because once you get to submitting to a spiritual master, you have to humbly ask him questions so he can help you advance when you take up this process. So here, it says, uh, by developing knowledge, one may possibly, he may. So may means maybe, and possibly also means he may. He may. Because Sometimes when you, it's said in here, when you get this knowledge, when you get gyan, you tend to think you're better than everybody. So that gives you pride. So we know that the philosophers and the educators and the, the uh, scientists, they all are proud. They think they know everything about everything. So in that situation, how are they going to actually recognize the Supreme Person of Godhead if they think they have the knowledge. So we know the scientists think they're God. Oh. Okay, so that's the one I wanted to bring out, that we have to be humble in order to access this knowledge that's been given. So in, also in text two, What I took out from text two is that generally in the material world, whatever knowledge we get is contaminated by the three modes of material nature. And knowledge which is not contaminated by the three modes is called transcendental knowledge. So, you know, all this knowledge that we have, you know, like, I remember going in school, you have to remember all the dates of the wars, you have to take history, you have to, you know, learn English, you have to take math, you have to take 
you know, you know all the things you have to do to study when you're in school. But what is the real knowledge? This knowledge, this material knowledge, helps you advance in material life because, you know, you have to work and all like that. But it doesn't help you understand why you are in this material world, why you have a body, who is Krishna. It doesn't help you understand your relationship to Krishna. This is, this is the primer. This is the most important knowledge of anything. You know, you have to know your relationship to Krishna because eventually you're going to leave your body. You have to die. You know? And it means that if you just have material knowledge, you're just going to come back here to the material world and everybody in the material world is suffering. We're all suffering. You can see what the suffering is now with the COVID. Everybody is suffering, like anything. You know, like the flood, the COVID, the third wave, that's all you're hearing. So we cannot think that we're going to be happy in this material world. Krishna is showing you. And I heard a lecture a day or two ago when someone was saying that now everybody has to wear a mask although a lot of us are not wearing, but we all have to wear a mask, which means, like, who, at, before we heard of COVID and before we heard about wearing masks, the only ones who wear masks are thieves because they don't want you to recognize them. So now we all have to wear a mask, which is means we're all thieves. We're in this material world. We're taking everything from Krishna, but we're not giving anything back. Nor are we trying to understand him. Nor are we trying to recognize him. So it means we're all thieves. You know? Just to have a material body means you're a prisoner. If you weren't a prisoner in this material, you wouldn't have a material body. You'd be in the spiritual world. So we're all prisoners in this material world. So that's why it's very important we should understand and recognize the Supreme Person of Godhead as our master. The one who is providing everything for everybody, whether you're a devotee or not a devotee, or whether you're an ant or whether you're an elephant. He's providing everything for every single living entity. And on that basis, even we should just recognize him and offer something back to him for providing. Okay? So generally, so I'll repeat, generally in the material world, this is from text two, the second paragraph, whatever knowledge we get is contaminated by the three modes of material nature. So I want to explain that. The, the three modes of material nature, we're all controlled by the three modes of material nature. There's only two options for the living entity in this material world. Either you serve Krishna or you serve Maya. Either way, you're going to be controlled. Best you be controlled by Krishna and surrender to Krishna and not by Maya. Because Maya is going to do a number on you. So it's going to trip you and make you think that you're very important, that you're the center of everything. And then you're going to suffer, and then you have to come back here. It's like, I don't know if in India they have, like, in America they have what they call carnivals, and they have these um, wheels that go around, and you get in, you sit in, and you go around, and you go around, and you go around, right? So that's what we're doing here, being in the material world. We're just going around and around. And not only that, this human body is a blessing because animals cannot understand spiritual. If you bring a dog in here and a monkey, a monkey or dog in here, they're not going to sit and listen or ask questions. So the material body is very important because it's the vehicle that helps you, that will help you once you surrender to go back to Godhead. So we shouldn't waste our lives you know, frivolously. We should be serious and try to get out of this material world by going back to Godhead. So the three modes of nature, which is the title of this chapter, it's the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, and the mode of ignorance. And as this chapter goes on, it describes the characteristics of each mode. You know, it's very, actually it's very detailed because it, it tells you so many things about, you know, what are the characteristics of, of the mode of goodness. It, it has to do with the f type of food you like to eat. It has to do with the place you should like to go. It has to do with the times of the day you like to get up. 
And as devotees, we know getting up in the Brahma Mahota hours in the mode of goodness. And it's good to also chant at that time because that's when the energies are in the mode of goodness. But the longer the day goes on, the more you get into the mode of passion and then later on you get into the mode of ignorance. Best to chant if you can. Try to chant early in the morning. Go to Mungo Arti, see the deities. It starts your day off nice. Chant your rounds, you know, and start your day off in remembrance of Krishna. I know I went to um, Jayapur at one time, and it's so beautiful. I don't know if any of you have been to the Govindaji temple, but everybody comes there before they go to work, and it's so beautiful that they're glorifying and singing to the Lord before they go and do anything else, any material job that they have. They just glorify the Lord. They start their day out in that way. So, um, but knowledge which is not contaminated by the three modes of nature is called transcendental knowledge. And that knowledge is all about Krishna. So we'll go to text three. Um, Okay. In text three, the sentence I took out is, this one talks about um, how Krishna impregnates the Brahman and making possible, the, he makes the possible the birth of all living entities. Everyone is his part and parcel, every single living entity. So, um, he's a supreme, but it says, as explained in the seventh chapter, beyond this there's another superior nature. The living entity, the living entity. So the living entity can decide to uh, either like I said, either surrender to Krishna or surrender to Maya. There's only two choices. And uh, the living entity is conditioned, and he's called marginal because he can go either way. When we're in the material world, because of material nature, we are, we are controlled by material nature, we can go Either way, we can, you know, decide to follow him. Because we have free will, Krishna has given us free will. Thank you all for coming. If you have to leave, thank you so much for coming. And I hope you have a safe trip back. Jai. Hari Bolo. Yeah. So, so as I was saying, so the living entity, he can, you know, choose. He has a choice. Krishna doesn't interfere with our choices. Because, you know, like, if you don't have free will to love Krishna, he doesn't want you to love him by force, you know. That's not love. So you have to, you know, make a choice. You can have a choice. I want to follow Krishna. I want to understand Krishna. I want to be with Krishna. You no. Know? That's a choice. Or you can say, no, I want to go into material nature, I want to have this, I want to have this, I, you know, you, I want to fulfill your, all your material desires, but you don't want to follow Krishna. Mm -hmm. So in text 4, as I was saying, so in text 4, here he's saying that it should be understood that all species of life, O Son of Kunti, are made possible by birth in this material nature, that I am the seed-giving Father. So he's telling you that I'm, the, I'm the, the supreme controller. I'm the one from where all of us come. He's, he's the one that gives birth, gives the seed, you know, for all of the living entities. And it's saying that such living entities are seen not only on this planet, but on every planet, even on the sun, on the sun planet. Every 
everywhere there are living entities. Within the earth there are living entities. Even within water and even within fire. And even within our bodies, it's all kind of living entities. And all these appearances are due to the mother, who is material nature, and Krishna's seed giving process. And in the last uh, sentence, it says, the purport is that the material world is impregnated with living entities who come out in various forms at the time of creation according to their past deeds. So Krishna remembers um, our desires from the previous life, and he sanctions. He's the sanctioner. You want to complete, say, say we leave this body, and we are not thinking of Krishna, we're thinking of something we wanted. Oh, I, we have to be careful what we say. Because we may say, oh, I want a house, or I want this, or I want that. We should be saying, I want Krishna, I want Krishna, I want Krishna. I was listening to a lecture today by B.B. Govinda Maharaj, and he was saying, he was giving the example of Mother Yashoda and how she was so absorbed in Krishna. She couldn't stand when he had to leave to go herd the cows. You know, she would follow him and he would have to tell her, oh, okay, Ma, you know, like, just wait for me. I'm, 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 I'll be back. But she would, you know, like, do, I think you, like, do some kind of homer to him before he left, make sure he's safe. Then she would, you know, then go bring his sons and keep them here for a while. And, you know, and she was, that was the, her only thought is about Krishna. And we have to get to that point. Because later we'll talk about how can we uh, get to the, the, the status of transcendental. We can get to goodness, then we have to get to pure goodness, but then we have to get to transcend, being transcendental. And we have examples in the Srimad Bhagavatam that help us to understand where we need to get to because we still identify with the body. We have Prahlad Maharaj. His only, only thought was always of Krishna. 24-7. He was always preaching about Krishna. He's always thinking about Krishna. He knew Krishna would rescue him from whatever situation was in. He never, he never tried to save himself. He never tried to run away. His father put him in the fire. His father put him in his oil. His father threw him off the mountain. His father tried to poison him. But yet, he did not protest. He didn't protest because he was on the transcendental platform. He wasn't attached to his body. He, was, he knew he was protected by Krishna. He loved Krishna. No. So he was transcendental to whatever was going on, whatever his father was doing. And even at the end, he told, uh, he told Krishna that, I want you to save my father. I want you to liberate him. I want you to save him. No. He didn't say, yes, kill him because he was trying to kill me. You know, he said, please, you know, have mercy on my father. You know, so he was very transcendental. So then, uh, text five, which Prabhu said wasn't covered. I don't know who was here yesterday. He said we didn't do five. No, sorry, five. No. Huh? Okay, I'll just read it then. <laughs> Text five. Sapam rajasthama iti guna prakriti sambhavaha nabadnanti maha baho dehi dehi nam avyayam. Material nature consists of three modes goodness, passion, and ignorance. When the eternal living entity comes in contact with nature, O oh mighty arm Arjuna, he becomes conditioned by these modes. And we know that he has no control over that conditioning, none whatsoever. It is said in 714, Daivi Eshagunamai, Mama Maya Durat, Yaya Mam Eva. 
Ye papadiante mayam etim tarantite. This divine nature of mind, consisting of the three modes of material nature, is difficult to overcome. But those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. And in this material ocean, it's huge. You can imagine being in a, an ocean. Me, I don't know how to swim, so definitely I would drown. There's <laughs> no, no issue there. But you can't, you can't even see land. You know, so think of the... Mm, not even just anxiety, but how you would feel. So that's what we're in. But if you surrender to him, he shrinks that ocean down to the size of the water in a calf's hoof print. And you can just easily step over it because Krishna, <coughs> because you've surrendered to Krishna, you've recognized Krishna as the Supreme Person of God, and you've taken shelter of him. So it's saying that, you know, the living entity, because he is transcendental, has nothing to do with this material nature. So even though we have nothing to do with it, which part of us has nothing to do with it? Hare Krishna? Which part of us has nothing to do with material nature? Soul. Jai, it's the soul. Well, the soul has nothing to do with eternal. So we have nothing to do with material nature, but because of our conditioning and because we are identifying with this material body, we think we're this body. You know, we think we're black, we think we're white, we think we're man, we think we're woman, we think we're Gujarati, we think we're American, we think we're Russian. You know, we think we're from this nation or that nation. We identify, we think we're husband, we think we're wife. But none of that is us. We are the eternal part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Eternally, always, eternally. And when we leave here, when we leave this body, everything is gone. Whatever we identified with. But if we carry that ID, that identification with us, when we're leaving the body, then we'll come back and repeat it. You know, like if the man is attached to the wife, he'll come back in the woman's body and vice versa. Or if now we see so many people are loving their dogs like anything, it's just too much. <laughs> I mean, I won't go into, you know, like how in love with dogs people are. Now, we can recognize them. They're living entities as well. We can give them prasadam. We can recognize Krishna's in their heart. But to the extent that we love them, then we can come back as a dog. No, we'll come back as a dog. So we should be very aware of trying to at least move into the mode of goodness because that will help us along our path to move up to uh, Sutta Sattva, then Transcendence. And I'll talk about that, hopefully. Um, okay, so then we'll move on to the, uh, the text six, which is the text for today. Um, so first I'll say that Krishna is addressing Arjuna O sinless one. And in Burijan's book, uh, Surrender Unto Me, which is an overview of the Bhagavad Gita, he says that uh, the comment is that Arjuna is addressed as Anaga, sinless. So the two sins of the mode of goodness are attachment to sukha, happiness, and gyan, knowledge. But Arjuna is not bound by either. So we know that Arjuna is a pure devotee. And um, he's actually here and hearing this Gita so that we can hear it. You know, 
but he's a pure devotee, so he's not affected. You know? So it is saying it is attachment to happiness and knowledge, not happiness and knowledge in themselves, that binds the living entity in the modes of good in the mode of goodness. And so such such attachment it breeds pride. You become proud because I have this knowledge. And then, you know, um, us, and both pride and attachment, both of them are symptoms of the mode of passion. And he's saying, in other words, attachment to jnan causes agyana, which is ignorance. You know. So to be in the mode of goodness, you have to be detached. So in this chapter, Krishna is explaining how the jiva gets covered by material nature. So we know that maya has a throwing potency and she has a covering potency. And so the living entity comes under her control. And you cannot escape from her influence unless you surrender to the Lord, unless you, you know, get a spiritual master, unless you surrender to a spiritual master, a pure devotee, who can lead you out of this darkness of, you know, being in the material energy. So, um, I just wanted to, oh, I wanted to read some of 714. It is saying that the Supreme Person of God that has innumerable energies and all the energies are divine. So Maha Maya, Maya herself is divine, you know. Although the living entities are part of his energies and are therefore divine, we're all divine beings. Due to contact with material energy, their original superior power is covered. Being thus covered by material energy, one cannot possibly overcome its influence. As previously stated, one cannot possibly overcome its influence. As, oh, I'm sorry, as previously stated, both the material and spiritual natures, being emanations from the Supreme Person of God that are eternal, the living entities belong to the eternal superior nature of the Lord. But due to contamination by the inferior nature of matter, their illusion is also eternal. So we, have the, we are divine. We have the same qualities as the Supreme Lord. The, in, in Prabhupada always gives the example of the ocean. Krishna is the ocean and we are a drop in the ocean. If you take a drop out of the ocean, it will have all the same properties of the large ocean. But um, we have the same qualities, but we're, we don't have the, we're not quantity. Only, only the Lord is the superior energy. Okay. So, you know, the question always comes up, like, I've heard it so many over the years that I've been in ISKCON. The question always comes up, well, how did we get here? You know, how did we fall? But the question, that should not be the overriding concern. The overriding concern is, how do I get out? You know? Like if you're going to rescue someone from the ocean, you don't ask them first before you rescue them, how did you get there? 
because he'll drown. <laughs> you first you rescue them. You know, you don't say, send and question them, how did you get here? You know, what was your process of getting in? How did you get in this water? How did you get to drown? How are you drowning? You know? But, but it seems the question always seems to float around that, that, people, that the devotees ask, you know. And here it's saying no one can trace out the history of his becoming conditioned as a certain date in material history. Consequently, his release from the clutches of material nature is very difficult. Even though that material nature is inferior energy. Because material energy is ultimately conducted by the supreme will. So she's, she's under his will. Which the living entity cannot overcome. Inferior material energy is defined herein as divine nature. Due to its divine connection and movement by the divine will. So... Also, the modes of material nature are called guna, and the meaning of guna is rope. We're bound by the ropes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. And also, we should also, like, as devotees, understand when we are in the mode of passion or in the mode of ignorance, because we're still sometimes affected, at least for me, I'm not transcendental. And I, I know when I'm in the mode of ignorance or in the mode of passion or sometimes in the mode of goodness. No. It's easier to be in the mode of goodness if you're in an atmosphere that facilitates the mode of goodness. Like I was living on the farm for 15 years and definitely being on the farm is in the mode of goodness. Because there's no distractions there. And your en entire focus is on the service. This is uh, the ISKCON farm, the Gita Nagri farm. No, and you become more in tune with nature. You can start telling the time by the movement of the sun. You can be with the cows. And you can... Um, feel um, like the, the change in your consciousness when you're in an atmosphere that's conducive to developing the mode of goodness, you know. So it said, another meaning of guna is rope. It is to be understood that the conditioned soul is tightly, tightly tied by the ropes of illusion. A man bound by the hands and feet cannot free himself. He must be held by a person who is unbound. Because the bound cannot help the bound, the rescuer must be liberated. Therefore, only Lord Krishna or his bona fide representative, the spiritual master, can, can release the conditioned soul. Without such superior help, one cannot be freed from the bondage of material nature. And then devotional service or Krishna consciousness can help one gain such relief. And Krishna, being the lord of the illusory energy, can order his insurmountable energy to release the conditioned soul. He orders this release out of his causeless mercy. on the surrendered soul and out of his paternal affection. Krishna loves all his parts and parcels. He doesn't like to see them bound up in the material energy. He wants them to come home. He wants to have loving exchanges with his devotees. And out of his paternal affection for the living entity who is originally a beloved son of the Lord. Therefore, surrender unto the Lord's feet of the Lord is the only means to get free from the clutches of the stringent material nature. So, back to our verse. 14. 
so uh, in this, this verse, Krishna is uh, presenting, Prabhupada's outlining, the pros and the cons of the mode of goodness. So in the first paragraph, he says, you know, the effect of developing the mode of goodness in the material world is that one becomes wiser than those otherwise conditioned. And then he says, a man in the mode of goodness is not so much affected by material miseries because basically he thinks he's happy and he has a sense of advancement in material knowledge. This sense of happiness is due to understanding that in the mode of goodness one is more or less free from sinful reactions. Actually in the Vedic literature it is said that the mode of goodness means greater knowledge and a greater sense of happiness. And before I came into the uh, Krishna Consciousness Movement, I worked with a lot of people who considered that the acts they were doing were all good. Like, uh, demonstrating against, you know, injustices in the world, saving the whales, uh, cleaning the environment. These are all pious activities like uh, raising money for Africa for children, feeding the hungry, you know, helping the homeless. And that's in the mode of goodness, but it doesn't release you from the material world. No. It's, you'll still become bound you know, by material nature because you're attached to the mode of goodness and you're happy in it because you think you're doing so many nice things and you're happy about it. And even the scientists, they think they're making such nice contribution to the world. You know? So they also become, you know, puffed up and have a lot of pride. And the philosophers and the poets, as Krishna, as uh, Srila Prabhupada says, so then the cons are that, he says the difficulty here is that when a living entity is situated in the mode of goodness, he becomes conditioned to feel that he is advanced in knowledge and is better than others. Well, that's the mood that develops. That's pride. In this way, he becomes conditioned. And he says the best examples are the scientist and the philosopher. Each is very proud of his knowledge. And because they generally improve their living conditions, they feel a sort of material happiness. But this sense of advanced happiness is in conditioned life. So he says this is still a conditioned life. It makes them bound by the mode of goodness of material nature. As such, they are attracted toward working in the mode of goodness. And that's, you know, the, the materialists, the people who do all these welfare works. You know, they, they are attracted to working in that way. But as long as they have an attraction working in that way, they have to take some type of body in the modes of nature. And thus there's no likelihood of liberation. They won't get out or being transferred to the spiritual world. We're all here because we want to go home. We want to, we're worshiping Krishna because we want to go home. We want to go back to the spiritual world. We want to serve Krishna. We want to have eternal happiness, not temporary happiness. Repeatedly, one may become a philosopher, a scientist, or a poet, and repeatedly become entangled in some disadvantage of birth and death. But due to the illusion of the material energy, one thinks that that sort of life is pleasant. Say, so they think it's very nice. I like this kind of life. So, um, the thing is, how, how do we move towards the mode of goodness, you know? And I'll just, before I conclude, I'll just give you, you know, some of the, the um, scripture that I found that speaks to this. Um, I was reading... Um, First, you have to fix your mind in the service of the person of Godhead. This is the Srimad Bhagavatam 2, chapter 2, text 1, no, um, chapter 1, uh, text 18. You have to uh, free your mind from polluted desires. You know? 
the desire that we eventually want to come to is that I just want Krishna to be happy. I don't have to be happy. I just want Krishna to be happy. And if, if you've ever had the experience of serving the Lord and Krishna reciprocating with you, you, you feel this sense of happiness. You feel happy, you know. Sometimes he gives you that mercy of feeling happy because he's happy. That way you know, oh, I did something to please Krishna. And then, I mean, basically, we know, you know, we have to, you know, I, as I said before, get up early. You know, the, the three modes increase their influence, different influences, through various types of scriptures, through water, through the place, and the time, through recreation, through the friendships that we make with other persons. It's, if we can, like, try to associate with persons who are in the mode of goodness that will help us also move toward the mood of goodness. And I read in the Uddhava Gita, until one attains the platform of self-realization and is thus able to give up his illusionary identification with the gross and subtle body, which is caused by the three modes of nature, he should cultivate the mood of goodness. So we have to be cultivating the mood of goodness. When one's quality of goodness is enhanced, religious principles can be practiced, leading to an awakening of one's transcendental understanding. And we definitely need to free ourselves from the bodily concept of, of life. And then one who diligently remains aloof from influence of passion and ignorance can enhance the quality of goodness. So just, so in conclusion, it actually also boils down to purifying the mind. And that comes back to our japa and the chanting. We should do the chanting in the mode of goodness we should hear the Maha Mantra. We should be attentive and try to focus on Krishna. And uh, Rupa Goswami, and the mind, we know, it's said in the Gita, that the mind is so restless and turbulent that it's hard to control. So Rupa Goswami, that's why Rupa Goswami, Raghunath Goswami, sorry, Raghunath Goswami wrote the book uh, Manasa Shiksha. Because if the mind wasn't a problem, why would he write a big book about the mind? Because, you know, to help us deal with the mind. There's so many books that can help us deal with how to control the mind and try to chant our japa. First thing in the morning in the mode of goodness and then with attentiveness. So I'll end the class right here because I think it's time now. And if there are any criticisms, I'll take any corrections, any comments. Please. A anything you'd like to add to, you know, to it. Any ideas about how to chant better around, how to get to the mode of goodness. Yes, Babu? Yes. Man and he's attached to woman. Oh. Uh, he's attached to that woman as being a man. So why he should get a woman's body? Like a woman wants to enjoy with a man because she's attached to the woman's body and the pleasure. A man is attached to the man's body and the pleasure associated. So why he has to get a woman's body in his next life? Well, we can. I mean, oh, sorry. Okay. Please. Attached to this body and 
Well, um, okay, we have an example of Bharat Maharaj who got attached to a deer and gave up, you know, neglected his spiritual practices. So because he concentrated on the deer, then he got a deer's body. It is said in the scriptures, Prabhupada says that attachment to woman, you know, is is not good. No. And can someone else you want to come in with this because the man is attached to a woman. He's attached to her. He's attracted to her. Is he not? He's attracted. That's what how it starts. <laughs> He's attracted to a particular woman. It's not that he's thinking, you know, well, I'm in a man's body and I'm not attracted to that woman. He is attracted. That's the fact. He's attracted to that woman. And the more you, 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 you get into, you know, I mean, for devotees, you have to, for a, a husband and wife, the center of that relationship is Krishna. Not the man or the woman. The, the husband uh, should be a good husband in terms of following all the religious principles. And then the wife follows the husband. But the center of that relationship you, is Krishna. You have A up top, which is Krishna. And then you have B, the husband, and C, the wife. No. So that helps with loosening the attachment. But, but it also recommended, Prabhupada says so many times, that at a certain age you just go to the forest and you loosen that knot because it's called a knot. They're bound together. No? Any, any addition? Anyone want to add to that, please? Hedi Bull, Prabhu. How does he see that are attracted? You can just see them as spirit souls. Like the spiritual master, he sees everyone, whatever body you're in, as spirit soul. And he wants to help that spirit soul go back to Godhead. So we just need to advance, you know, in our Krishna consciousness in order to see every single living entity not for our pleasure but for Krishna's pleasure. I remember just one story before we break up. Um, I remember I, um, I went with my, my Guru Maharaj to, to New Vrindavan. New Vrindavan is a uh, temple, Iskand temple in the United States in West Virginia and I was fairly new, but I had just got initiated. And he, he was dancing in front of Shula Prabhupada in the Palace of Gold. And I had the realization that he was offering us to Shula Prabhupada. So we need to offer our child, our wife, our husband to the Lord. We shouldn't become a husband. We shouldn't become a spiritual master. We shouldn't become, you know, anyone who is in charge unless you can direct your, you know, whoever, you know, you're, you're cultivating, unless you can offer them to the Lord so they can go back to God. That should be your main focus. I want this person who doesn't belong to me to go back to God. This person is actually Krishna's. This wife, she belongs to Krishna. This husband, he belongs to Krishna. He's not mine. No? Okay. Anything else? Thank you, everybody, for being in the class. Hare Krishna.